Good morning and uh, welcome to this Euractiv online event, which is kindly supported by the Polish Economic Institute. My name is Frédéric Simon, I'm the Energy and Environment Editor of Euractiv, and I will be your host for today's event, titled What will be the cost of including transport and buildings in the EU ETS? Now, today's discussion comes just a few weeks before the European Commission is due to present a new package of energy and climate laws aiming to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030. And the inclusion of transport and buildings in the EU's carbon market will certainly be one of the elements of the package that will be watched with uh, the most attention uh, by policymakers not least because of the social uh, impact this could have and uh, the potential rise in fuel prices that uh, this could entail. So to discuss this topic today, I am delighted to welcome Adam Guy Bourget, Under Secretary of State at the Polish Ministry of Climate and Environment, Andrzej Marku from the European Roundtable uh, on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition, Sophie Dufour from the Green Mobility, NGO Transport and Environment, and Piotr Arak, Director of the Polish Economic Institute. Welcome to all of you and uh, thanks for joining us today. We'll start this virtual conference with a series of short opening statements uh, from the speakers and then we'll move on to a, a Q&A session that will also include uh, questions from the audience. But before we dive uh, further into the topic, let me first introduce our keynote speaker, Pascal Confin. He's chairman of the European Parliament's Environment Committee, and he will give us a welcome opening address. Pascal, the floor is yours. Uh, Pascal, you need to unmute yourself. We of can't course, hear you. that the usual thing, that's <laughs> the most uh, popular sentence of the year. <laughs> you are muted. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, for your invitation uh, to your active and to you, Frederic. Um, it's a pleasure to share a, a few thoughts uh, about uh, the design of the reform of the ETS and specifically the extension uh, or potential extension to uh, the, 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 the the heating bill and to uh, the fuel bill. Uh, I think, and I will be very, uh, very clear and I will explain why, uh, I think it's a very, very bad idea. It's a very bad idea for several reasons. The first reason is that the climate impact is between limited and very limited. Uh, if I take uh, the impact assessment of the Commission itself, uh, the reduction uh, expected in the transport, road transport sector, uh, thanks to this measure, measure, is of 3%, which is way, way lower than the impact of standards. So it's uh, very clear that when you, even if you do not enter into the political discussion, but just the climate discussion uh, and the efficiency discussion, this tool is not efficient or is much less efficient than other tools like the standard. So whether you discuss about buildings or whether you discuss about tra world transport, the first key priority is standard, standard, standard. So the impact is limited. The climate impact is limited. But the political, political cost is huge, huge. And if I have to take recent examples, I have unfortunately too many of them. Uh, obviously, uh, everybody has that in mind, the yellow jacket in France. Uh, but more recently, you have the current German debate on the carbon price on fuel. And it has a real political cost for the Greens. So I would say that uh, some political parties in Germany have managed to find a weapon against the Greens, which is exactly the core of the discussion on the carbon pricing on fuel. 
and on buildings. And third, Switzerland. Because of the campaign of populist parties on the carbon tax on fuels, the whole climate law was voted down in the recent referendum. So the, the political cost is huge. It's a huge risk. And in addition to that, in addition to that, part of the money that would be collected by this extension would be used to uh, reinforce the recovery plan. So I can't see Ursula von der Leyen saying, OK, I'm going to task, tax your fuel for a very limited climate impact with a complete uh, anti-social spectrum, because it's, as we all know, it's uh, anti-redistributive, to pay back the recovery plan of the EU. That's exactly the opposite, the opposite of what we have said from the very beginning. And on the contrary, that's exactly what the extreme right said. So uh, I really urge the Commission not to go down that line. And another element is that why do they want to extend the, the, uh, the, 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 the ETS? First, for a financial reason, because they need to get money. Why they need to get money? Because they do not plan to phase out uh, free allocations robustly. I'm not saying overnight. I'm not saying even completely. You can have justified limited number of uh, free allocations, but phasing it out gradually, but for real. They do not plan. They do not seem to be planning to do so. So of course there is no additional money or a very limited number of additional of, uh, amount, sorry, of the additional money, and then you need to have the extension to pay back the recovery facility, which is again politically disastrous. So uh, the, that's why, for all these reasons, and I could have a, a other argument if needed, uh, I do think that it is a real political mistake. The whole thing. Uh, so that's why I hope, I hope, uh, I'm not in the uh, Commission's uh, seat, I'm not in the seat of uh, Franz Timmermans and Ursula von der Leyen, but I hope that they will not do it. And if ever they do it, uh, at least, at least do it as an option. And then give uh, the co-legislators the possibility to do it or the possibility not to do it. And uh, I think one idea could be first to delay this extension of one year or two years, let's say two years, to see if it's needed later on in the process. I don't think so, but maybe in two years' time, things would be different. And another option could be uh, you put two packages as an option. Option one, without extension. Option two, with extension. And then what does it mean as a consequence for the rest of the text? Because one argument of the Commission in the, the, the discussions I have with them is, OK, but if I don't do the extension, then I have to be more stringent on the other parameters. Why not? It depends. Why not? The whole thing is, of course, is to deliver on at least, by the way, it's not at least 55. As you know, it's at least 57 net after the trilogue and the deal with the parliament. So including UUCF and so on and so on. So of course, and you have to be consistent. And by the way, we manage to win, when I say we, the parliament team, manage to introduce in the climate law a, a mandatory consistency check all over the process of the fit for 50, what we call fit for 2030 package, all over the process. There will be mandatory checks made by the Commission towards the two co-legislators, Council and Parliament, to check if their proposals, so let's say uh, the general approach of the Council, of the, the vote in, uh, in NV committee, the vote in the plenary, and so on and so on, are still consistent with the Fit for 2030 package and with the objective set in the climate law. That's a very interesting provision because it will force us to be consistent. 
So that's why I think to conclude, one option could be either to delay for two years the extension or to say, well, here is the package with extension, here is the package without extension, both are consistent, the political cost is not the same, the political parameters are not the same, both are consistent, now up to you. Council, up to you, Parliament. Uh, then the debate will, will uh, take place, and then I think we, we win this debate because I can't see a lot of politicians going to the streets and say, I want to uh, reinforce the recovery facility with your heating bill, uh, massively uh, anti-redistributive. So uh, as I'm quite confident on this, uh, I think uh, we will manage not to go down that line, but it will be way better, way better if the Commission does not take its risk neither. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, I understand that you have a few <clears throat> more minutes to stay with us for, for a couple of follow-up questions. So um, I understand you're not a fan at all of this idea, but the European Commission seems to uh, be uh, intend to move forward with it. So assuming the Commission proposes the extension of the ETS to buildings and transport, how could uh, the European Union manage uh, the social uh, implications of this, because uh, after all, social policy is not a competence of the European Union. So how can we ensure that the potential social impacts of this is managed across all EU member states in a way which is uh, relatively even and fair? D does that imply new budgetary commitments from the EU budget? Well, uh, Frederick, it's a question to Franz Timmermans or to Ursula von der Leyen, to my, not to myself. Because actually, uh, Franz and I, I'm, I, 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 it's, it's, I, I'm not in line with the Commission on that one. Usually I'm in line with the Commission, but not on that one. Uh, and Franz is saying, well, well, let's create a fund. Okay, so you create a problem and then you create a fund to solve the problem. So just uh, basically, don't just don't create the problem. Uh, because as you said, Exactly as you said, it's not a competence of the EU. What about the territorial comp uh, breakdown? What about the timeline? I mean, if, you, if your budget as a household is uh, 50 euros uh, uh, at the end of the month, you can't wait one year, one year time to be reinforced by a uh, bureaucratic thing that will start with the European level and then uh, trickle down to the capitals and blah, 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 blah. That will take time, of, of course. And these households don't have time. And maybe one, one, another argument, because it's, 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 uh, I think it's important because we usually hear that here in Brussels that we need carbon pricing to change the behaviors of the, 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 the economic actors. Of course, it is true for corporates. It is true for corporates. I mean, a corporate, the largest ones for sure, the medium ones, let's say, that, yes, the very small ones, it's less true, but for the vast majority of big ones and medium ones, they are economically rational. They have CFOs, they have the capacity to allocate capital, they make calculation around the next, the profitability of an investment versus another one over the next five, 10 years. That's their job, that they are economically rational. So then having a, a price on carbon is, uh, of course, a very good idea. That's what I'm fighting for a real price on carbon, at least 60, maybe more. But we are not as household. I'm not, you are not, nobody is in this uh, discussion is economically rational as a household. We do not have uh, internal CFO. And if we have a problem, we do not fire our family. Okay, so we can't, we, it's not just, it's another universe, it's another logic. That's why the carbon price then does not work. I don't know anybody calculating, okay, if in the next 10 years, the price of carbon goes to X direction, then my heating bill will blah, 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 blah. So I have an in incentive to uh, buy this uh, new equipment. And by the way, if I am a tenant and on a landlord, landlord, landlord sorry, anyway, I just can't invest because it's not my uh, flat. So there are too many frictions in real world, in real world. And please, okay, economists are usually not in the real world, but as politicians, we are, uh, at least uh, I, I try to be, uh, and uh, it doesn't work. So that's why 
you create a problem for bad reasons and then you create some uh, very complicated engineering to try to solve the problem. So that's why uh, this question is a legitimate question, but my answer is just don't create the problem. Okay, that's clear. Um, one question though, I mean, if households in your view shouldn't uh, end up paying uh, the bill, then who should foot the bill uh, at the end of the day? Because everybody agrees that some kind of price signal needs to be put on transport emission, on building emissions. If, uh, like you say, households should not foot the bill, then should it be the, the big companies or somebody else? So, uh at least two, two answers to that question. Uh, you could argue that, okay, but if you, if you put a real price on carbon on uh, companies, then of course it will trickle down to the final consumer. So the impact is the same. Economically, it's true. The impact might be the same, but politically speaking, it's very different because it's not a tax a tax because of course for the average citizen the difference between the tax or a carbon market leading to the just the the the, the, the 10 euros or, or 50 euros more on the heating bill it, it's just a tax okay uh, the rest is just uh, for for us it's not for the average citizen so um this is politically very sensitive okay so it's way different if it's just the market price that use the carbon market to trickle down the carbon effect, it's different. Politically speaking, it's different. Economically speaking, it's more or less the same for the final consumer. But between the price on the carbon market and the final impact for the final consumer, you have so many differences, so many choices on all the value chain. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, translate the price, or I'm not going to translate the price for competitive reasons, or I'm going to change my technology, or I'm going to change the, another element of my supply chain to compensate, and so on and so on. So thinking that if you, at the beginning, the very beginning of the supply chain through the carbon price in the market, you put a price on carbon, and thus it has an automatic effect at the end of the supply chain for the final, final, final consumer, it's wrong. It's wrong. It might happen, but it might definitely not happen. So that's why it's economically rational to have this carbon price for corporates and then leading them make their choices economically with economic rationality, which I hope will also be climate rationality. That's good. That's fair. That's why I'm in favor of a strong carbon market, carbon price for corporates, not price for households. And by the way, to maybe to conclude uh, the political discussion on this. I mean, it started from why, why do we have to discuss this issue? To be, to be very clear, why do we have to discuss this issue now? Because one, one leader, I'm not even saying one country, one leader said to Ursula von der Leyen, it's a good idea, let's do it. This leader is Angela Merkel. The, you, Germany is doing so with the carbon price and so on and so on. Fine. It was fine last year. Start, you can start having the real debate now. And you can have, you start having the CDU, so Merkel's party, saying, whoa, pop, 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 I'm, not, I'm not in favor of uh, the green uh, higher taxes on fuel, blah, 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 blah. And that's the weapon they use now. And look at the consequences for the green end, by the way. So they are using this argument in the German political debate and at the same time at the same time for uh, 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 we'd say going into the direction of the idea coming from Germany from CDU from Merkel we would do it at the European level and maybe at much higher level because we are talking about 40 50 euros per ton when in Germany it's more 25 30 40 so that completely can it's, you cannot explain as a CDU member that you are trying to kill something in your own country, but the very same measure, you are very supportive of it at the European level, because of course the impact for the final consumer will be exactly the same. So once we have this on the table, 
I can tell you that once we challenge CDU, CDU uh, politicians, my guess is that more and more they will say, well, you know, blah, 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 it's more complicated, well, let's forget it. But for the time being, it's not yet on the table. So it's not yet sensitive enough to have this debate. And I experienced in France the fact that it was voted, the, 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 the rise of the carbon price uh, on fuel and, bills and heating bills was voted unanimously, unanimously. So you can't have more. <laughs> At the end of the day, zero, forget about it. So you can have drastic shifts between the starting point and the ending point. That's exactly what happened in France. That's exactly what happened in Switzerland. That's exactly what is happening in Germany now. And that's exactly what would happen in Europe if the Commission does this mistake. Right. Thanks a lot, Pascal Canfin, for taking the time to uh, speak to us this morning and, uh, and giving us this opening address. Uh, we wish you a very good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, uh, let me turn now to our panelists and uh, their opening statements, starting with Adam Guy Bourget, Under Secretary of State at the Polish Ministry of Climate and Environment. Adam, the floor is yours now. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation, for the organizing this, this debate. Well, I think uh, uh, probably uh, Pascal just you know, expressed most of the the, um, the arguments uh, um, I would have raised in an initial uh, uh, statement. But just to, to make it short, I think it is indeed a very uh, uh, challenging um, policy. Uh, challenging because because of the impact it has on the on the forest. And just jumping on a few of the uh, of the arguments that were that were raised already. In, um, in in Pascal's intervention, I think we can we can see uh, uh, clearly that uh, we need more policies at EU level to achieve our targets to achieve a climate neutral EU by 2050. This is clear, but the problem with that idea is the very limited effectiveness in terms of climate reductions, the very limited effectiveness of introducing uh, a carbon price in this in this sector. And, and the other uh, negative uh, consequences, and that is very well also re reflected in the analysis uh, um, which we uh, which is being presented today, um, is uh, the very um, strong uh, social impacts it has. Um, and I think it's a bit uh, uh, it's a bit paradoxical to be uh, uh, thinking of um, creating new resources. Uh, to to uh, to reimburse the the, uh, the 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 RRF uh, and 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 basically creating a, a tax that uh, that is targeting the poorest households in the first place uh, when the other options that are that were being discussed was were like taxes financial transactions taxes and big companies and the commission seems to be making a choice of taxing poor poorer households and I think this is as uh, as uh, as was said earlier, I think politically this is a this is a mistake, and uh, and we should uh, we should rather uh, look for other uh, options to achieve our targets that would be more efficient in terms of um, reductions they could generate, and uh, and less uh, problematic from uh, from a social. Uh, impact of extending the ETS uh, to transport and buildings. Andrei Marko, the floor oh, is yours. Oh, sorry. I uh, yeah. Thank you, Frederick. I, I I could not hear. I I could not hear the beginning. I was going to say unmute yourself because I couldn't hear who you're referring <laughs> to. Can you hear me now? We can hear you perfect. Well, we, we, Go we, ahead. Thank you. We all have to say the unmute yourself. Listen, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, to be here, and uh, the, the pleasure is indeed uh, be very big to get to know Piotr and 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 the institute. And it's been a great pleasure to work on this paper with with them and, and Cambridge. 
But a couple of things. First of all, very impressive, the intervention of, of uh, Mr. Canfin. Uh, I would be of two minds. And one mind is do not include it for the reasons of uh, many of the reasons that Mr. Canfin outlined. Uh, it's, absolutely, uh, it's absolutely correct. I think that the uh, uh, population, the general population, has a few other things to worry about than continue to look at the price of carbon. But that, on the other hand, is also true for the regulation of electricity and other, uh, other things that we have deregulated and now used to be a regulated uh, utility and we would get the price of electricity every day and Electricité de France will deliver that uh, without any many, too many problems to get a contract from here, there or, or somewhere else. Uh, it is true that the, uh, the, the small uh, guy, the small person does not have the ability to hedge. Uh, we have to understand that all the companies are hedged to 2026, 20, 27, 28, whatever uh, they can they hedge at 20, 25 euros a ton. So they will not feel this if you in, start introducing this for the for the people and the uh, uh, in the households and transportation and buildings. They will not have the ability. The second thing that I would say, the elasticity is much much lower. And this is a, this is going to be a, a, a going to be a problem because you're going to have to have very high prices. Now, if you include it, and it looks like the commission is kind of made this mind to a large degree that this may happen, then there's an advantage. The advantage is that you do tell people what the real price of this transition is at the speed in which is being proposed in the climate law. And at some point, that is going to have to dawn on people that there is a real price and it has to be paid. The one thing that I've learned in the many years that I've been in different business and other, uh, and other organization, there's an 11 commandment or 11 and 12 commandment is who pays the price because invariably somebody will pay the bill. And the second one is where does the money come from? Uh, because you're correct, we are going to create a problem. And that problem, the way we've been treating things recently, is that we have thrown money at the problem. So somebody's going to have to get compensated and somebody's going to have to get money to deal with the situation. The question that I would ask is where is the money coming from? Because at some point, it's probably the next generation EU, somebody pays the bill. Now, if we do this, nevertheless, which is, looks like likely it will happen, there is a number of things that need to be considered. One of them is to offer revenue recycling scheme to assist vulnerable people. This is in the form of transfer payment, direct bill assistance for, for, the, for the residential uh, revenues which can, can be recycled to provide rebates for low carbon and electric vehicles, tax rates for low carbon incomes to offset the increase in fuel prices. These are things that can be done uh, to increase and implement uh, current energy efficiency and renewable energy in such a way as to lower the price of EUAs, uh, to ensure that you maintain and strengthen EU tools like a solidarity mechanism. Uh, it should be required that 100% of the revenues generated by solidarity allowances be spent on energy and climate purposes. And last but not least, the increase in the modernization fund and innovation fund to mitigate the impact of the ETS extension in those member states where the transition is more challenging, as well as to help bringing into the market breakthrough clean, clean technologies in the transport and building sectors. In order to make sure that this is fair and efficient, this should take into account countries' actual investment needs and relative capabilities as well as the national level of the GDP per capita. So there is a wish list of, I think, considering whether this makes sense. Now, uh, the motives of the motives of Mr. Canfin and mine are different. You know, he has very good political motives and I respect that. I'm not a politician, so I'm more indifferent to that. But there's also the reality of this is going to happen probably at least as a proposal and it should be accompanied by some of the measures that we outlined. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you very much, André. And so let me turn now to our next speaker, and that is Sophie Defour from Transport and Environment. Sophie, the floor is yours. Thanks, Frederick. Look, transport has really been the climate bad boy of the EU economy. While other, other sectors have reduced their emissions since 1990, transport emissions have gone up. 
So to achieve our climate goals, we will need to bend that transport curve. And the best way to do that is through massive electrification. If we want people, companies and truckers to go electric, we will need to make that affordable. And since the days of Henry Ford, we know that mass production drives down costs. TNE just published a report showing that price parity for all EVs can be achieved by 2027. And the key word here is can. This will only happen if production of EVs is scaled up early. That's why the transport centerpiece of the Fit for 55 package is not the ETS, but more stringent CO2 standards before 2030. And the ETS, on the other hand, it will only have a limited effect before 2030. Because to be socially acceptable, it will start at a low price. Now, while a 25 euros per ton carbon price might make fuels 7 to 8 cents more expensive, it only reduces CO2 emissions by about 3 to 4 percent. So the ETS alone will not bend that transport curve. The heavy lifting will need to be done by increased national climate targets, stringent pollution limits for cars and buildings, rapid electrification, and building up a world-class charging network. And the ETS, that will first and foremost be a revenue-raising instrument. That's why Europe needs to tell a compelling story to, tell, to sell this ETS. Because even at low prices, not only low income, uh, income families, but also certain profiles of middle income families will be hit heavily. So to avoid gilets jaunes across the continent, Europe will need to make sure that the money returns to these people in an equally visible way. And the best way to do that is via a climate dividend. With the money that you raise, you can give each EU citizen an equal amount of money over a periodic basis. So in the beginning, Pricing will just be the icing. But say Europe makes the bold choice in July and it raises ambition of all its regulatory tools and no more internal combustion engine car is sold after 2035. Then we are still stuck with a legacy fleet, part of which will be around even after 2050. So in the end, carbon pricing can play a bigger role. In the end, the ETS can phase out this legacy fleet more quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And let me turn now to Piotr uh, Arak from uh, the Polish Economic Institute. Thank you. Um, so first off, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to Andrea, European Roundtable on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition and Cambridge Econometrics. We, we did a paper, uh, which I'm going to just shortly uh, um, discuss with you all and, uh, and show the, the um, the projections that we made um, uh, of the impact of this, uh, if this new solution, as it was discussed before, um, uh, will have on households uh, throughout Europe. The first, the first point I wanted to make is that pandemics uh, are seen as uh, great equalizers. So we think that the, um, uh, the level of uh, inequality um, diminishes when we have a pandemic or you know events like that. Uh, this isn't the uh, the case in 2020 uh, in some of the countries where we see the data uh, because of the high income uh, and gains from capital. We also saw increases of inequality. So when Pascal said that you have economists out of touch with reality, we try to stick with uh, with uh, with reality and how how um, uh, some certain uh, um, uh, phenomena are, are impacting, um, you know, the average uh, European. And if you have an, um, uh, if you want to limit the, the reduction, limit the, uh, the, the climate uh, and achieve climate neutrality and limit the um, greenhouse um, gases emissions, uh, then you for sure have to go on on households and transportation. This is 20, uh, 27% of the CO2 emissions come from transportation, 36 from uh, from buildings, and 71% of the transport emission comes from road transportation and 70% from buildings. It's the residential sectors where we live, and this is all across Europe. If you have changes as proposed uh, with, uh, um, probably proposed by the European Commission, uh, with an uh, ETS system of sorts uh, for the transport and residential buildings, uh, then uh, if you want to reach the reduction of uh, almost 40% uh, 
at a 20, uh, 27 countries level, uh, then this means a cost of a trillion uh, euros by 2040 uh, in order to uh, spend on the additional taxation uh, and increases prices of energy uh, on transport and from, um, uh, from the residential housing that uh, the Europeans live. And what this means, uh, it's not an issue if you're in the you know, upper bound, uh, upper 10%, even upper 20% of households across uh, European countries. But if you're in the lower uh, quintile, so uh, the lowest 20% of the income across Europe, across the countries, uh, so you, if you're the, the lowest 20% of Fran uh, French people, you're the lowest 20% even of Germans. Uh, then, as the political debate in Germany uh, on on this uh, additional taxation uh, is going on, um, um, uh, this would increase the prices of uh, of um, of um, uh, uh, of transportation and residential buildings in 2045 uh, by uh, um, 18 percent uh, at the lowest point and almost uh, above 40% if you go and the price of UTS ETS goes higher. The same goes with residential buildings and 2014 mints are uh, additional cost of more than 50%. Uh, and and uh, what I wanted to point out uh, uh, is that uh, this, this, uh, this means um, almost 430 euros um, uh, additional uh, um, uh, costs uh, on households and um, uh, 373 uh, euros of additional costs uh, if you can count in the transportation emissions. So being socially conscious and knowing what's uh, what this uh, could have an of an impact on the uh, on the um, uh, on the poor people uh, across europe uh, i would say that this this would polarize many societies um, and we need some mechanisms that would help to uh, diminish the, the effects on the lower quintiles uh, of income of europeans I, 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 I'm not, you know, I don't see this happening without some kind of social pack, uh, social package, uh, some kind of mechanisms that would uh, decrease the costs uh, for the energy, um, uh, those people in energy poverty, which, you know, have uh, additional costs of energy that are, that are higher than 10% of their disposable income uh, per month. Um, this this would for sure be seen as a very problematic matter if it comes into play, uh, and uh, the European Commission is going to be blamed by many European governments. Uh, and we also have to think about this when we introduce something like that, which is going to target poorer households. So this is my point. Thank you, and looking forward to the discussion. A lot, uh, Piotr, for uh, this uh, this short presentation. We can now uh, turn to uh, the Q and A, and so uh, let me start immediately with some of the ideas that have been uh, put forward. Uh, so, um, the uh, the European Commission's climate chief, Franz Timmermans, he spoke of a climate social fund. And Sophie de Four uh, from TNE just now spoke of some sort of climate dividend uh, for uh, citizens to, to compensate for the rise in, in fuel prices. Now, do you think this is something uh, that uh, could work? And maybe we can start with you, uh, Adam Guy Bourget. Well, I think that the problem with, with that is one of you have to answer one of the questions that Andre pointed out is where, the, where is the money coming from? And, and the problem with the, the way this tax is, is structured is if you, if you would take, a, say, a, a simple, very simplified view of society and say you have two households in a society, one with a, a heat pump, a, a solar panel in its roof, a, a, a Tesla in its garage, and another one uh, with um, an old uh, um, uh, Internal combustion engine, uh, a regular car in its in its uh, garage, a very old uh, 
house, uh, badly insulated, uh, and uh, and and firing uh, its uh, boilers with uh, with with, with a, a very old and inefficient coal boiler. Um, you know, guess guess which of these two households is the poorest one? I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. It's it's the one using coal, and it's the one that would be the most heavily uh, impacted by this tax. And actually, the other households with with a heat pump, with a, an electric vehicle in its in its garage, wouldn't be paying any of that any of that uh, tax. So, even if you redistribute, even if you create a mechanism to re redistribute all the resources you're getting, you're getting them from the poorest. So, even if you give them back, it's 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 only coming from them. So, I don't really see how such a mechanism uh, c could be uh, uh, evening out the the. Um, the, the negative social impact of um, of, the, of creating that tax, since since the the bulk of this cost will be borne by the by the poorest, even with redistribution, it's going to be very hard unless you have a totally different approach. But then it's not the it's it's not the tax you, you you're talking about. But you need to find a, another way, another uh, uh, source of um, of revenues uh, uh, to to address that. Okay, uh, so maybe let me ask then the, the, the follow-up question. What other source of revenue? Uh, because, um, I mean, obviously one of the difficulties with this is that when you're putting a system in place at the European level, um, either you find a compensation mechanism uh, like uh, this climate social fund that Franz Timmermans uh, spoke about, uh, but which has uh, the problems that you just mentioned, or you leave maybe uh, that to the member states. So what is your alternative there? Do you suggest that simply the Commission drop the idea or that some other way of funding uh, can be found uh, somehow, Adam Guiguaji? Well, I think, you know, we have to, to, to look at what, at least in, in theory, this, this instrument is made is meant to be doing. If this instrument is meant to be helping us to reduce uh, uh, our emissions, uh, we have to look and compare with the options available, which is the most efficient way to reduce emissions in the, in the transport system, for instance. And I think here, uh, um, Sophie from Transport Environment was, was you know, very clear in, 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 in how it looks in practice from a, an expert's perspective. What can you do to, to reduce emissions in transport, what would be the impact of, um, of, of these measures on transport emissions? It's something we see very clearly today already, you know, the, 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 the price of oil is, is changing all the time. And even uh, when the, the price of the pump station increases uh, uh, significantly, and, and sometimes it, 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 it varies significantly more even that it would vary uh, even with a uh, uh, a 25 or 50 euros uh, uh, per ton price. Even in those moments, the impact on the consumption of, of is is very small. So the reductions generated by by this instrument will be insignificant in comparison with what needs to happen. Which you know, as 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 we said was said earlier, we need to make available new vehicles, electric vehicles, zero emission vehicles that are affordable for, for our society, help the poorest with support from the state to buy these, these vehicles. But, but it's, it's, it's more uh, um, uh, a matter of, of making those alternatives available in the market that will help the transition in this sector. And this, these will be the more, the more efficient uh, uh, policies and there will be uh, um, uh, uh, much uh, much less uh, costly, much more effective, and definitely much less costly for um, for the the uh, the poorest households. Thank you, Adam Guiborge. So uh, let me put the question now to Andre Marku. Um, wh what are your thoughts about this idea, uh, which was put forward by France to Mamans to create this climate social fund, or what Sophie spoke about about uh, some kind of climate dividend? Uh, for citizens. Do you think that could work somehow? Andre Marco? And you should unmute yourself. Whoops, un please. Unmute yourself. Yes. There, there you have it. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say this, but 
I look, I, I spend a good part of my life in, in business, but you know, I, I, I used to work in a Canadian crown corporation, which is, which is a crown corporation by definition is not private, but the word dividend means that somebody is producing something that has a dividend. So I'm not sure that dividend is the, is the right word. I would say the following thing. And again, I'm of two minds. I think that we live in a society that we still should be driven a priori at the first line of defense by market forces. And there is the best way to do that is to price it. It's not the best, not the, the best way, but it's the only way that has brought us so far to the level of prosperity that we have. So my first reaction is I want to price it. And that would, inc that would mean that, yes, we should include it. And I would like to be upfront and people should know what it costs. I understand politics, but I'm not in the political game. I think that you owe population to know what they're getting themselves into at the speed that you're getting into what it costs because they will pay the price somehow. On the other hand, there is the reality of different elasticities. And I think that there's, there's not much you can change in that. I know that in, in, as Adam mentioned, is that the price went from, I don't know, a dollar, a dollar or something a gallon to something else. And it took a long, long time. It had to go very north before anybody changed their cars. So the reality is what it is. I think that producing a, a social, fund a social dividend a social fund is something that you would gonna have to do it's like many of the solution that we are proposing in this fit for 55 in the european green deal we know that in the long term is going to create other problems but i don't know that there is another solution if you insist on pricing it you will have people in the low in the in the households people that are in, not in a situation to support these price increases that are going to need support. We have seen, and Adam, you are from a country, so am I originally from countries that we have seen transitions. And unless you manage the transition well, you're going to end up with a, in, in a period that we have seen in, 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 the late nine, in the early 90s in many countries that we don't want to see a repeat of. As such, yes, we do have to have this, but someone has to draw the line and be realistic because sustainable transition means that we move on the economic, social, and environmental dimension at the same speed. And the question that needs to be asked, which is a very, very unpleasant question, is how do we manage to manage the social and economic part of this transition? Because there's only so much money that you can print. And this money has to be paid by somebody. So my question, I repeat, the question is when you draw the line is how does it add up? Because to, in my mathematics, which I am an engineer, it doesn't add up. Thank you, uh, Andre Marco. So I understand you're open to the idea, at least, of a climate social fund. Uh, let me uh, now turn the question to Piotr uh, Arak. What are your views about this uh, idea of Franz Timmermans to put forward a climate social fund or to put somehow on the side some sort of uh, climate uh, dividend uh, for, for citizens? Do you think that is a good idea and do you think it could work? Well, of course it's, it could work, but the question is who's going to pay the bill, as Andre uh, put it out. So it's it's um, uh, that's a fair point to make. So um, uh, we need additional revenue, or the European Commission needs additional revenues in order to pursue this goal. Uh, so um, in order to uh, target the poor households that they don't uh, suffer the costs uh, that much in the period of uh, after introducing this this kind of new tax schemes. And we know that the price of EU ETS has to go very much up in order to reach the climate uh, goals and reductions as they are put into place uh, by um, 2050. It means that a cost above uh, 170 uh, euros per ton of CO2. And uh, I think this price is unrealistic. Uh, I think no, uh, no politician, no policymaker across Europe is going to allow uh, the prices of EU ETS to go uh, up that much because of the political cost uh, of it. 
And this means, uh, as, as I shown, increases in, um, uh, in the energy bills uh, for the poorer households, for the electorate, uh, very much so. Uh, and if, if a, a scheme would be put into place, it means, you know, uh, a couple hundred billion uh, euros to be spent across uh, uh, 25 uh, years uh, uh, or even more. So uh, the, the fair question is, who's going to pay that? Is it go are we going to tax the rich? So are we going to have a wealth tax across Europe? Are we going to have a financial transaction tax? Uh, or are we just going to have uh, increases of prices of goods sold? Because introducing uh, you know, additional uh, ta taxes on transportation, we know that the hydrogen cars aren't in place uh, at this moment. And hydrogen is the, the only thing that we can use um, uh, for lorries and uh, cars moving uh, goods across Europe uh, uh, at this moment. So in the next 10 or so years, uh, we're going to use still diesel lorries. Uh, and we're going to have increased costs of goods sold across Europe. We're going to lose competitiveness. Uh, the, the, the consumer are, are not are not going. The consumers are not going to be happy about that. We're going to have uh, you know uh, more costly goods sold across Europe. And then uh, we need a carbon border tax in order to have the goods from I don't know, Russia. China um, uh, or other uh, non-European or non-Asian uh, non countries uh, being uh, less competitive because they're going to flood our own market because our, uh, the goods we produce in Europe are going to be three or four times more costly uh, than uh, the ones produced outside. So uh, this, is, this is a very, very big uh, issue. Uh, and in order to target this, this problem, this also means that we also have different countries across the globe uh, to uh, follow the same road. And we know that China, with its commitment to 2060 as a climate neutrality in parts of its industry, is just partial. It's not the same. They're not going to tax their, their production uh, as we do. So this is, um, this is somehow uh, being uh, diminishing the potential of economic growth and prosperity across Europe. So we also have to think about that. Thank you, uh, Piotr Arak. So uh, I hear a few suggestions uh, there coming from your side. CBAM, uh, definitely one that you seem to support. Potentially a financial transaction tax or some kind of wealth tax. I'm not saying you support that personally, but these are some of the options that you listed. Um, Sophie Defour, maybe you have a few ideas about how that uh, climate social fund, if it ever sees the light of day, um, where should the money come from then? Uh, do, you, do you support uh, CBAM, the FTT and all, and, and all of that? Well, I, I think we all agree that um, pollution should have a price. So pricing carbon in transport and heating fuels is in principle a good idea. But of course, the question is about when uh, and to what extent you do it. So you cannot tell people, oh, uh, here's a hundred euros per ton carbon price that you need to pay. And at the same time, we haven't foreseen anything uh, of alternatives for you where you can uh, affordably switch to. So we need to put the policies in place to make sure that people can make uh, a shift to zero carbon alternatives. And so for this, this, this CO2 price on, on, um, on transport and heating fuels, if we do it via an ETS, it will raise revenues. In the beginning, we will need to use these revenues mostly to compensate uh, low-income families for the increase in their fuel prices. And we think a good way to do that would be through a climate dividend, because you can build a positive story uh, about the EU's climate efforts, um, and you make sure that it's that it's sort of universal. I mean, you can exclude like uh, the, the the richest, but you make it sort of universal. But then you add to that uh, a climate action, action social fund, which could invest in projects that enable people, and preferably you start with the low income families, to um, switch to zero carbon alternatives, so that they are no longer exposed to these higher carbon prices. So, for example, you could um, renovate houses of uh, low-income families or you could come up with uh, uh, innovative financing schemes to ensure that low-income families also have access to EVs. 
uh, and if you if you have sort of like a patchwork uh, of different layers of social compensations in place, then you can make sure that no one falls through the cracks. And at the same time, you enable people to make the shift in the longer term, which also enables you to increase your carbon prices over time. You cannot do that in the beginning. In the beginning, you need to start with low levels of carbon pricing. But I would like to, to also say that, I mean, we've talked a lot about um, where the money should come from to invest in the transition. And the ETS is one um, uh, revenue source. But let's not forget that um, company cars are, are subsidized to the tune of 32 billion a year in uh, EU member states. Fossil fuels are subsidized to 50 billion a year in uh, EU, EU member states. Uh, we have massive amounts of money that are available to the recovery funds. Uh, Piotr has talked about financial transaction tax. There are so many uh, revenue sources available um, and, and, and we will need to invest these in the climate uh, transition and it cannot only come from ETS. The ETS revenues will not be the only sources that can be used to make the transition to zero carbon alternatives. Thanks, Sophie de Four. So I understand uh, you're open to the suggestions we heard, but also you're saying uh, the, 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 the separate ETS for transport and buildings should, should start at a relatively low level with an exemption for the uh, low-income families, uh, correct? But I don't think it needs to be an exemption for low-income families because then you will have a very uh, complex system. Uh, but your your revenues should target low-income families as a priority to compensate for the fuels prices that you have increased. Mm -hmm. But then you're taking money from them and then just redistrib redistributing it to the, to the same people because, like we heard, it's going to be the poorest who are likely to be impacted the most. Well, it's going to be everyone uh, paying, but of course, this will have a larger impact on low-income families' budgets. So that's why in, if, you, if you redistribute the revenues, you should ensure uh, that the majority of it goes back uh, to them. And preferably, yes, as Pascal Confin said, uh, you also make, need to make sure uh, that this happens uh, timely so that they don't have to pay higher prices for a year and then uh, wait for the money, which will make sure that they can't make ends meet at the end of the month. Okay, thank you. Andre Marku, maybe a few thoughts about the ideas that we've uh, heard just now about new potential sources of revenue, um, um, you know, a, a focus on low income families, etc. Does could could any of those ideas work in your view? Well, I mean, they all provide sources of revenue and you can get more money there's always someone more money there's a point where you also have to think as to what kind of economy do you want to you want to run there is a point that you think is this about a redistribution effort i think there is we're all for social uh, for social responsibility but yes there are these funds but these funds have also deep social and economic implications uh, you're talking about about the money that should be put in different funds, and there's this fund and that fund. I can tell you that I am in the in the UNFCC negotiation, and people have been promised 100 billion euros or dollars a year uh, in order to do the transition, and it's never materialized. So, are you? Are you what is the guarantee that this money is going to materialize, and from from where? I think that there's got to be a realization that somebody pays the bill and that these sources of revenue are not coming from somewhere else they're coming from somebody and as long as that is clear that is coming from someone and that somebody pays and that is made very transparent i the only thing uh, frederic is that i would like to make the case for strongly i'm all for the electric vehicles you know i love electric vehicles i'd like to have one and i think they're fantastic and I, I, I hope that I, I can afford one soon. But there is one thing that you need to, to make sure is that you are playing a very, very high stakes of poker with the economic future of Europe and that you got to be very transparent where the money comes from and who pays the bill. Because saying that we can take money from here and put it here, in the end, it still comes back to the same people. There's, there's, there's a zero-sum game at some point. There's some growth in this, but there's also a zero-sum game. So I am, my main point, and I apologize for this, is let's be transparent. Who pays and how is it paid? 
So um, thanks for that, André Marco. Maybe a few thoughts on this, uh, Adam Guy Bourget. Um, what, what new sources of money do you think could be made uh, available to, to finance uh, this uh, transition uh, directed to uh, uh, households? Could it come, for example, from the upcoming carbon border adjustment mechanism or from a financial uh, transaction tax or some other means? What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I think if, if we look at the, especially in the, the challenges with buildings, uh, it is uh, from um, uh, a social perspective, but also um, it is just a much more efficient solution to support um, through uh, investments, grants, uh, in maybe in the case of, of um, uh, middle class families, also loans. Uh, from the state, preferential loans to 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 help uh, reduce uh, emissions in buildings, improve energy efficiency, change boilers, etc. And these are the kinds of programs that I mean we are doing in in, in Poland, hugely successful clean air program, my electricity, which are uh, supporting households investing in renewable um, uh, energy, uh, which they produce for, for their own needs and improving the, the, the insulation of their, their buildings and changing their borders. And these programs are, are, are hugely uh, uh, successful. And obviously we need to be able to do more, uh, uh, to help more the, the households that, uh, that have bigger needs because, because they are poorest. And, and sometimes, it's an issue we see in Poland, sometimes it's, it's not even only a, a, a challenge um, in terms of financing, and I think here I would I would join what what Pascal was saying at the beginning. We are as households, as individual households, we're not necessarily rational, and, and even if something makes um, uh, sense economically, it is sometimes for and that's what we see in Poland terribly difficult for them to organize uh, um, the investment itself. This is why we we have set up in our scheme we have set up a, a, an additional support. For, for, for municipalities to help these households carry out these investments. Um, and, and we hope it's, 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 it's going to work and it's going to help uh, um, increase the, the amount of, um, of, of, um, of refurbishments. Obviously, the needs in this area are huge. When we were discussing uh, internally uh, what, how to use, how to use optimally for Poland, uh, the, the, the resources available in the uh, in the next generation EU. You know, I was telling colleagues I can use all of it just to renovate households in in, in Poland, and I wouldn't be even uh, uh, dealing with all the the, the the needs we have. So it's obvious that the the, the, the needs are, are huge. But then it's a question, you know, where do we take the, the money from? As you were asking, do we take it from the, the poorest? Is it really the, the, the way we want to finance our, our climate policy? Um, I, I don't think so. And I think it's, uh, it's rather um, something where we should uh, uh, look for other resources, like the one that, that were discussed uh, um, uh, uh, today, and also looking at making sure that the resources that are being contributed to the system, because I totally agree with what was repeated earlier, pollutants should pay for their emissions. But at the same time, we should make sure that these resources are reinvested in these sectors, in these uh, uh, countries, to make sure that the, the, the necessary investments actually happen and drive down uh, emissions. Because if they are if they are only paying, paying and paying, but never transforming, then we are, we're also missing the, the point of, uh, of our policy. Thanks, uh, Adam Guibourget. Uh, just to make clear then, uh, you're, uh, you're saying, uh, I mean, what you say sort of Im implies probably bigger transfers uh, of money from the EU level to the member states. Um, because I, I heard you mention, you know, the, the, the programs that you have uh, in Poland with those preferential loans coming from the state. So you, are, are you saying there should be greater transfers of money from the EU to the national governments? Well, definitely, if, if we look at what the, um, the, the Commission itself assessed was needed to, to reach 
our um, um, earlier 40 percent, our earlier 2030 targets. And if we compare it to what uh, um, the, the sustainable uh, uh, finance plan was showing, how much are we really ready today to, to mobilize? At the time, there was already uh, a, a huge dis discrepancy between the needs and what we are able to mobilize. So it is certain that we need to find more resources um, uh, from uh, um, uh, not only uh, uh, public uh, resources, not only EU budget resources, but also uh, how to mobilize private investment in order to be able to face these uh, costs. But definitely, yes, uh, um, uh, resources uh, mobilized at the EU level will be necessary to finance. Thank you, Adam Guy-Bourget. Uh, let me now uh, take a question that came uh, from the audience, uh, and it's coming from Christoph Streisler from the Austrian Chamber of Labour. And he's asking um, our views about um, including just road transport uh, in this sort of um, parallel ETS, and so not buildings. Um, what would be your views on that? And maybe we can start with you, uh, Piotr uh, Arak. Do you think that would be a good idea? Mm, to drop the, the, the buildings and just have, um, uh, have uh, road transport. So, exactly. You know, this, 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 uh, I pointed out that this, this uh, um, uh, in comparison to housing, uh, this, for example, uh, is a bigger issue in terms of uh, costs of goods sold in Europe. So uh, we're going to actually have a, you know, a green inflation of percent certain goods that are uh, um, uh, being sold in the European Union because everything has to travel. Uh, we, uh, you know, we export, we import uh, certain goods, uh, we buy you know, furniture, cars, produce car parts. And they all go through, uh, not all of them go through uh, rail. Uh, so we would have to also think what the businesses are going to do when we impose uh, this, uh, this taxes on, on road transportation. I, given the, um, uh, given that the, 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 the um, Given the technology advancements, as I said, with hydrogen, if we are going, going to have the technology uh, available and a substitute for diesel uh, lorries uh, available to, to companies, then I say, OK, this is a, a, quite a good solution because we're going to have a chance to, for the businesses to adjust and have a different uh, kind of scheme, which is more climate neutral, which is better for the environment. Uh, but now, if they have no other means of, uh, you know, traveling uh, and selling goods, uh, increasing revenue uh, of companies, uh, then I say that also this solution is, is pretty bad. So we can agree that if we have a technology in place and we have um, cars available to, to um, the logistic companies uh, that are going to, you know, fulfill the need, so are going to be a substitute, even if they are more costly. Uh, than the diesel ones, and we don't have the infrastructure. Then I, I'm 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 for, because this is uh, you know not uh, just introducing an additional tax in order to have more revenue for uh, for um, uh, for the state, uh, uh, but it, we're going to push companies for more sustainable uh, sources of energy use. Currently, at this moment, we're just going to have a, a new tax uh, on on energy uh, and on on oil and gas. Thank you, Piotr Arak. Uh, very quickly, Sophie Defour, your thoughts about a separate EDS just for transport and, and not buildings. Do you think that um, uh, could fly? Well, look, I'm, I'm not a, a buildings expert, but in a, in a lot of the member states, you have very high taxes on electricity, uh, and that makes uh, that, that heat pumps uh, are, are not... Uh, a good uh, a good alternative to a lot of families uh, because they have to pay very high uh, taxes on uh, electricity uh, and often gas prices are, are, are lower so th there is a point to be made for uh, carbon prices as sort of rebalancing this difference between electricity and and, and uh, gas coal and oil prices 
But I think the real question here is about um, what I would call the hierarchy of, of regulations. So a lot has been said about um, um, social social compensation structures uh, and about making sure that the alternatives are available. And I think that's really the priority. So in the Fit for 55 package, as I said before, the transport uh, centerpiece and for buildings, the building centerpiece is CO2 standards, more stringent CO2 standards uh, for cars and for buildings. And if we have that, and if we build that up increasingly over time, and we make sure that the alternatives are available, and at the same time, uh, we create funds such as uh, a renovation fund, which can can take the shape of this climate action social fund that uh, Timmermans has been has been talking about. Uh, and if we make sure uh, that low income families are able to shift to uh, better housing, then you can increase pricing over time. But it needs to be a hierarchy of, uh, of, of these regulations and you need to make sure uh, th these alternatives are accessible or otherwise that you have really uh, a very, very uh, good policy in place to redistribute the money to uh, all families who would be heavily hit. And then I would refer again to this, this climate dividend uh, that has the potential to not just uh, uh, tackle those who we know will be in trouble, but also those families who are less uh, easy to identify, but who will also be heavily hit by a uh, carbon price. Thank you. Andre Marco, maybe very, very quickly, your thoughts about having a separate EDS for transport only um, and, and not buildings? The arguments that uh, Piotr has made, because I think they're, they're good arguments uh, in terms of the cost of goods. The other thing is we do have a, a uh, an infrastructure and a, a uh, uh, if you want, a city structure, the way wildlife is organized. So we can't ignore people that make a living and they do need to be able to move around. Yes. So this these are things that are really important. On the positive side, what I would say is that it would make sense to me because you target something. You can't do everything at the same time. It's just, in my opinion, just not enough resources. And this is a more targeted approach that can actually address one important, this is not as big as in, in California for argument's sake, but it's an important source of emissions. And I think targeting something with the technology, with the charging station, something that you provide a package, is probably something more realistic. Okay, thanks, Andre Marcou. Um, <clears throat> I think we're now reaching the end of this conference, unfortunately. Uh, but before we close, I would like to ask each one of you to summarize very briefly in a couple of sentences um, what you think should be the main message, or at least the, the message that you would like our viewers uh, to take home with them. And so uh, let's start with you, Adam Guibourget. Well, I think if you want to summarize that in a, in a, in a couple of words, I would say that it's um, uh, an ID that is uh, the extension of ETS is an ID that is not terribly efficient from a climate perspective. It's not going to lead to very significant reduction. So it puts into question the, uh, the, the, the sense of, 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 that, of that, an ID that has uh, terrible social consequences. Um, in particular in buildings, I think as the, the question for from uh, our Austrian uh, colleague was, was showing, particularly in buildings. Uh, so overall, not a very good idea. Okay, thanks. That at least is clear. Andre Marcou, uh, a, a few concluding thoughts or key messages from your end. If you must, if you must, then you have to make it part of the deal. This compensation is got to be part of the deal. Cannot be an afterthought or coming at, at a promise. Why? Because the uh, the solutions that have been part proposed are difficult political solutions. A Tobit tax, a, a transaction tax is not something that somebody will accept right away. So you better make sure that when you accept to do this, you also have the money that comes with it. And the second thing is, I think that we should make sure that this is not something that is left to the member states. Some member states have more money, other member states have less money. This cannot create a two, uh, two Europe's. Some of them compensate, some of them can't compensate. Thanks, André Marco. Uh, Sophie Defour, the uh, key messages uh, you'd like uh, our audience to take home with them. Thanks. So, in principle, carbon should have a price. 
But there's a question about when you do it and how you do it. In this decade, until 2030, the most important thing to um, reduce emissions in both the transport and the building sector will be regulations. So for transport, that means uh, more stringent CO2 standards for 2025, 2027, and 2030, and national binding climate targets to uh, create an incentive for member states to reduce their transport emissions. You can have carbon pricing as part of the policy mix in uh, the 20s uh, as, a, as a way to raise revenues. But then, as uh, Andre just said, the social compensation structures will be essential. And that's indeed both within member states, but also between member states. And then after 2030, your policy mix uh, can, can have a different weight of the different uh, regulatory uh, measures. Uh, but before 2020, really the most important thing that uh, Europe can propose for transport in the Fit for 55 package is more stringent CO2 standards and an ice phase out in 2035. Thanks, Sophie Dufour. And now turning to Piotr uh, Arak for your concluding thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, so first off, I wanted to thank to European Roundtable on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition and Andre. Uh, for his help uh, uh, preparing our paper in Cambridge Econometrics. Um, but uh, uh, the basic point I wanted to make is not to punish the, the you know, the underprivileged uh, Europeans. So it's uh, not an issue uh, just for eastern part of the country, uh, east part of the European Union. It's, a, it's an issue also for France, it's an issue for uh, Germany, uh, it's an is issue for Italy. Uh, if we're going to uh, punish the poorest households, then for sure we're going to see uh, political and social upheaval uh, and uh, polar political polarization. Uh, if it's the cost that we, we are uh, about to um, uh, commit ourselves uh, to, uh, then we need to be aware uh, where this is going to lead uh, and some compensation mechanisms uh, should be introduced in order not to have uh, uh, real political uh, issues across the block, because then uh, we could have more uh, yellow jackets. Uh, because this, these costs are going to be severe from the for the lower uh, uh, quintiles and lower deciles uh, of income. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Piotr Rak. So I think this wraps up uh, today's event. A big thanks to the Polish Economic Institute for supporting this event. Uh, thanks to our panelists as well for taking the time uh, to be with us uh, today. And thanks to our viewers, of course, for following us. If you missed uh, the beginning of this debate, uh, you will soon be able to watch it again uh, in uh, full on YouTube. It will be uh, posted in a few minutes. And if you, if you would like to know more about uh, upcoming events uh, organized by Euractiv, you're uh, welcome to check our website, events.euractiv.com. Until then, uh, take care, stay safe, and see you next time. <laughs>